Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be in Arkansas. Extra pleasure because my family's here. However, I do want to point out that my nephew-in-law is not here. And I know why Chris isn't here. It's called 63 points on the board against Texas. Chris is a Texas fan. <laughs> That's why Chris isn't here. I know, tell him I said that. <laughs> Today I'm going to talk to you on a subject that is very dear to me. Is the story of American patriots is the story of a glorious march to liberty. I am the assistant director of the African American Civil War Freedom Foundation which was incorporated in 1992 under the leadership of Dr. Frank Smith, Jr. <laughs> the mission of the African American Civil War Freedom Foundation was to build a memorial honoring the African American soldiers and sailors who fought for freedom during the Civil War. On July 18, 1998, our founding director, Dr. Frank Smith, Jr., and Secretary of State Colin Powell, then General Colin Powell, dedicated our memorial, the African American Civil War Memorial. The statue is called the Spirit of Freedom, sculpted by Ed Hamilton out of Louisville, Kentucky. On the walls behind our statue, we have the 209,145 names of all the soldiers who were officially brought into the Bureau of United States Colored Troops, separate department of the U.S. Army, established in the middle of the Civil War, May 22, 1863. We get all of our names from official service records held at the National Archives in Washington. So every name on our wall is backed by an official service record. And the number, 209,145, represents 10% of the U.S. or Northern Army during the Civil War. Now, on our statue, we have a sailor, yet we have no sailor's names on our wall of honor. The U.S. Navy during the Civil War was integrated, making it rather difficult to identify the men of African descent who served in the U.S. or Northern Navy. We do know, however, from Department of Navy reports that approximately 25% of the U.S. or Northern Navy was comprised of men of African descent. Let us examine these numbers. That's 10% of the Northern Army, 25% of the Northern Navy comprised of African Americans. According to the U.S. Census, 1860, African Americans made up 1% of the Northern population. Yet 10% of the Northern Army, 25% of the Northern Navy, very clear overrepresentation. And one would think, with this clear overrepresentation, that the story of these soldiers and sailors would have been an integral part of that master narrative of the Civil War presented in our schools over the last 100 years. Now, one would think that. But that's not true. The story of these soldiers and sailors has been one of the best kept secrets in American history. Intention suppressed early in mid 20th century. One of the best examples of the complete suppression of this story, 1944 in movie theaters across this country. You could have seen a film produced by the U.S. government entitled The Negro Soldier. The director of the film was Frank Capra, arguably the top director in Hollywood at the time. On the advertisement poster, that's the heavyweight champion of the world, Joe Lewis. The film, produced by the U.S. government, covered African American military service in this country from the 1770s, the Revolutionary War, to the 1940s, World War II. Mentioned African American involvement in every war in the nation's history during that period, except the Civil War. There was no mention, no image, of a single soldier or sailor, 10% of the Army, 25% of the Navy, and during the Civil War, 25 men of African descent had earned the highest honor bestowed on American military personnel for acts of courage on the battlefield, the, the Congressional Medal of Honor. Yet not a single one of those American heroes are mentioned in a film expressly about them produced by the U.S. government. Completely suppressed story. So why the complete suppression of this story in this 1944 government-produced film? Well, the film reflected what was being taught in the finest institutions of this country and what was being taught, that the American Negroes had done little or nothing to free themselves. Also, what was being taught and still taught in many schools across this country today is that on January 1, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves with the Emancipation Proclamation. That is an oversimplification of what happened. And to teach young scholars that President Lincoln simply freed the slaves with the Emancipation Proclamation is to mislead young scholars into believing that African Americans did little or nothing to free themselves. The true story is the story of a glorious march to liberty. The story of a disenfranchised, enslaved population that planned for a civil war. Let me repeat that. That planned for a civil war. Before the war begins, Dr. Martin Delaney would write, I now impart to you the secret, it is this, I have laid a scheme and matured a plan for a general insurrection of the slaves in every state and the successful overthrow of slavery. This would appear in the Anglo-African, a newspaper out of New York in 1859. Hmm. Also in this, in this serial that's appearing in the Anglo-African, Delaney would write, 
of Arkansas. Why, that's the very thing. He's interviewing two individuals in Arkansas in, 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 this, in, this, in this serial. You are ahead of the other states. You folks in Arkansas must be pretty well organized. So here in Arkansas, before the Civil War, they're suggesting there's some or organization going on here. There, you must be pretty well organized, and you're ahead of the, re of the other states. So I want you to remember that, because later in this lecture, we'll find out exactly how Arkansas was indeed ahead of the other states. <laughs> Those who believe there's a civil war coming are members of Af what I refer to as African knowledge circles. It is very important that when we understand this group of Americans, these members of these African knowledge circles, we understand their language. We understand what they're saying. For example, when they say Sambo, they're saying brave warrior. So if you, if you believe it's a clown or a buffoon, you listen to somebody else. You're not listening to them. It's brave warrior. That's what it means. <coughs> Negus, N-E-G-U-S. That's how you find it in your dictionary. Means the descendants of the ancient Ethiopian royal lines. Massa means Egypt or captor. Suri means one with evil intent or the devil. So whenever a Fulani, this is his native tongue, I want to point out. So we're not imagining this is what he meant. Whenever he said, yes, Suri Massa, he literally said, yes, evil captain. <laughs> Secret language. <laughs> Hemby. Hemby. Hemby, all right. Hemby, good. Hemby in Fulani means one of the faith. A true believer. A true believer. Someone who can be trusted. Me means I. Hala means speak. Me hala means I speak. And they would speak in what they referred to as gospel talk. In Delaney's serial that appeared in the Anglo-African, he would refer to it specifically as gospel talk. Gospel talk is where you took the scriptures and you flipped them, you used them to speak to your reality. Which is interesting because often when we, we listen to some scholars talking about Christianity, they'll speak of it as if that was used to, to get the slave to submit. When in fact, if you listen to them, let them speak, they'll tell you that no, we flipped the scriptures. We use the scriptures to speak to our reality. One of the best examples of that was in a, speech, a sermon delivered January 1, 1808 at St. Thomas African Episcopal Church in Philadelphia by Reverend Absalom Jones. And Reverend Absalom Jones would use as his introductory scripture Exodus 3, 1 through 8. Where God has witnessed the affliction of his people. He's come down. And, and, and he's come down. He's going to deliver them from the hands of their oppressors. And, and John would go on to say, history gives us many examples of this, and what we're experiencing here is like what the Israelites experienced in Egypt. And he would say that the evidence that God came down is in the creed of this nation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. He said, this is evidence that God has come down in the creed. He would also argue that in the Constitution of the United States, there were clearly anti-slavery goals such as to secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. And he said that if the great houses, which means Pharaoh, if the great houses of this country did not set the captives free, there would be consequences, literally a curse from God. <laughs> Reverend Jones will refer to this, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence of instruments of divine goodness. He's not the only African-American of this age. Prince Hall would refer to it as the instruments of divine goodness. George Lawrence would refer to it as the instruments of divine goodness. Mariah Stewart would refer to it as the instruments of divine goodness. And in league with the Constitution of the United States, they believed they could end the tyranny of slavery. Prince Hall would admonish his followers never to follow, never to assist anyone in a rebellion, an insurrection, I want to say they never to assist anyone in a rebellion, an insurrection, or any conspiracy because they were going to do it in league with the Constitution. Mm. David Walker, Prince Hall, Mason, originally from North Carolina and Boston, would write a book called The Appeal to Colored Citizens of the World in 1829. In his book, he would say that if the great houses of this country, if they don't set the captives free, God is going to compel them to bring sword against sword, brother against brother. He is forecasting a civil war. Mm. That is the forecast. Two years after Walker's appeal comes out, there, what, there is an incident in Southampton County, Virginia. Often referred to it, we refer to it as Nat Turner's Rebellion. 
or Nat Turner's insurrection. But remember, they were not to be involved in any rebellions or insurrections. But yet, Nat Turner is held in high esteem by the followers of Prince Hall. Why? Because they did not call it a rebellion or insurrection. In fact, Nat Turner would say to his interviewer, you've asked me to give a history of the modus that induced me to undertake the late insurrection as you call it. In other words, that's not what he called it. What did he call it? A demonstration. What does Moses do when he goes to the great house, to Pharaoh? He demonstrates the power of God. The consequence of not setting the captives free is there's going to be a bloodletting. There's going to be a parting of a Red Sea of blood. He is demonstrating. And just to show you the genius of this African descent secret society, Matt Turner, when he conducts his demonstration, it's in Southampton County, Virginia. If he is captured, and he was. If he is executed, and he was. He would be captured and executed, or let us say he would be incarcerated and executed in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, Virginia. Just like Jesus, he got hung in Jerusalem. A lead operative on a plantation with the planter there, with his agent there, could, could preach this sermon. Now turn away, turn away, turn away from sin. You know our Savior, he got hung down in Jerusalem. That you might turn away, turn away, turn away from sin. Brother, won't you turn away? Sister, won't you turn away? Turn away from sin. I'm more, he got hung down in Jerusalem. That you might turn away, turn away, turn away from sin. This was huge propaganda value. The League conducted a demonstration in Southampton County, Virginia. And in 1831, Nat Turner was executed in Jerusalem. The League forecasted a civil war. The clearest evidence of this forecast, in the clearest language, is on March 5, 1858, in Boston. Dr. John S. Rock. Now, Dr. John S. Rock was an 1852 graduate of the American Medical College in Philadelphia. Dr. Rock was a physician, a dentist, a school teacher, and the first African American lawyer to be admitted to the bar of the U.S. Supreme Court. Dr. Rock gave a speech in Boston on March 5, 1858. The occasion was the anniversary of the Boston Massacre. March 5, 1770, Crispus Atticus, a man of African descent, was the first to lose his life in what became the American Revolution. But I'd like for you to also know that Dr. Rock's speech delivered on March 5, 1858 was delivered three years, one month, and eight days before the Civil War begins. And Dr. Rock said, and I quote, Sooner or later, the clashing of arms will be heard in this country and the black man's services will be needed. 150,000 freemen capable of bearing arms and not all cowards and fools, and three quarter of a million slaves, wild with the enthusiasm caused by the dawn of the glorious opportunity of being able to strike a genuine blow for freedom will be a power which the white man will be bound to respect. Will the blacks fight? Of course they will. Close quote. Three years before the Civil War begins. It is very clear evidence that America's African descent population is preparing for a clashing of arms, a civil war that will give them a genuine opportunity to strike a blow for liberty in league with the Constitution of the United States. When Abraham Lincoln is elected as the 16th President of the United States, members of the League are overjoyed because they believe the Republican Party is their party. Whether it was Lincoln, Salmon P. Chase, or William Seward, the major candidates, the African-American community, members of the Loyal League, believed that this was the beginning of the end of slavery. So did South Carolina. South Carolina would secede from the Union in December of 1860. December 20th, 1860. In their cause of secession, they make it very clear why they are seceding from the Union. And if we want to appreciate what the Civil War was about, I recommend we go to the actions of the 15th President of the United States, James Buchanan, and the 36th Congress. And what did they attempt to do to save the Union? Well, by February 1st, 1861, by February 1st, 1861, seven states had seceded from the Union. James Buchanan, the President of the United States, he had an idea. His idea was to convince the states that had seceded from the Union to return to the Union by drafting and passing a 13th Amendment to the Constitution. The committee to draft this Constitution was headed by a Republican out of Ohio by the name of Torrent, uh, excuse me, by the name of Thomas Corrin. 
Corrin's Committee of 33 would draft a 13th Amendment to the Constitution that would make it to where Congress could not pass any legislation, any legislation that would abolish slavery. Now I want you to know what the solution is. So if you ever hear somebody say, the war was not about slavery, then let us ask them, what was the solution of the people who were trying to solve the problem? Did they come up with a solution, a 13th Amendment that dealt with tariffs? Did they come up with a 13th Amendment that dealt with states' rights? That's not what they did. I like to go to the source. I always love going to the source. And when you go to the source, the, the solution was a 13th Amendment that was ratified. Excuse me, not ratified, never ratified. That was passed by the House on February 28, 1861 and passed by the Senate on March 2nd, 1861, two days before Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated as the 16th President of the United States. Lincoln in his inaugural address made many overtures, really be becoming someone who would accept slavery if they'd only returned to the Union. That's the way his inaugural address sounded. But those seven states that seceded were determined to remain the Confederate States of America. And when open hostilities in the Civil War began on April 12, 1861, with the firing on Fort Sumter, Charleston Harbor, South Carolina, there were nearly 4 million Americans of African descent claimed as property held as slaves. There were 34 states in the Union. Slavery was legal in 15 of those states. However, at this time, only seven states had seceded from the Union and formed the Confederate States of America. On April 15, 1861, President Lincoln would call for 75,000 volunteer soldiers from the states. But men of African descent could not answer that call for volunteer soldiers because it was illegal for African Americans to join the Federal Army in 1861. It had been illegal since 1792 when Congress passed the United States Volunteer Militia Act of 1792 and President George Washington signed that legislation into law. Emphasis here is that it was the law. Abraham Lincoln and the executive branch of government had no legal authority to arm men of African descent. The executive branch does not make the laws. The legislative branch makes the laws. It's going to take an act of Congress for men of African descent to be legally armed during the Civil War. Alan Pinkerton, the famed railroad detective and head of Union intelligence in the first year of the war, or as he described himself, the top spy in the War of the Rebellion, observed, quote, Although as yet prevented from taking up arms in defense of their rights, these colored men had banded themselves together to further the cause of freedom. Close quote. Pinkerton would refer to these colored men, or more appropriately, these men and women of African descent who had banded themselves together to further the cause of freedom as members of a national organization called the Loyal League. It was also known as the Legal League. In this part of the country, the Mississippi Valley, it was known as Lincoln's Legal Loyal League, or the Four L's. This secret African-American organization would become the single most important source of tactical and strategic intelligence during the Civil War. It would provide the top spies. This secret African-American organization would provide the most prolific recruiters of African-Americans for the Union War effort. This secret African-American organization had as its express goal to end the tyranny of slavery in league with the Constitution, thus a name like the Legal League. They're going to do it legally. When we examine this organization and trying to find out who the leadership, leadership was, it can be a task because, remember, it's a secret organization. So when they actually have a meeting in 1854 in Cleveland, Ohio, we can actually see the organizational chart and understand who the leader was. However, when they met, they said they were immigration. This was the Immigration Convention, the Negro Immigration Convention. In other words, they're leaving the United States. That's what they say. But if you read closely, William Howard Day, Martin Delaney, or Jordan Noble, for three of the names I've underlined here, you would appreciate that none of these men were, were, were believed in immigration. Delaney would actually say that he believed that, that America was evidence that God had a master plan to bring all the the people of the world, the nation of the world together in America. That doesn't sound like somebody who really wants to immigrate. But the clearest evidence that they don't want to immigrate is in their own Declaration of Sentiments. Article number 12, it says that as men and equals we demand equal political right, privilege and position of which whites are eligible in the United States and we will either attain these or accept nothing. That's within the United States. That's specifically within the United States. That's their goal. That's the goal of the Loyal League. That's the goal of the Legal League. Martin Delaney is the operations officer. William Howard Day 
is the leader of this organization. And Day had come out early in 1851 after getting his, his, his master's in theology from Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio. And he would say to a group of young African American radicals, quote, I consider the Constitution, I believe the Constitution is the foundation of American liberties. And wrapping myself in the flag of the nation, I would plant myself on that Constitution and appeal to the American people for the rights thus guaranteed. Close quote. That's the leader of this organization. We know what he's looking for. He's seeking to end slavery in league with the Constitution. So when they go to Chatham, Canada, I want you to appreciate that in Chatham, Canada West, they were only 50 miles from Detroit. They didn't go it very far. However, any planters trying to raid them could not enter there, and this is literally a military compound. And we'll come back when I say a military compound. They're getting training in Canada. That's why when you look at the senior officers, African-American officers, and non-commissioned officers in the Civil War, the top commissioned officers were all in Canada. Well, while the Union is very hesitant to use persons of African descent during the Civil War, in fact, some of them would say, this is a white man's war. You're not invited in. The Confederacy was very quick to use them. However, it is a misnomer to call them soldiers. Why? Because that's not what the Confederate government called them. These were enslaved persons. Here in Arkansas and throughout the Confederacy, you would actually have planters who would be required to provide X number of slaves to the Confederate Army. And the contracts would read that they would be paid X number of cents per day for each one of the slaves that were sent to the Confederate Army. And even the Confederate Army would even give a guarantee. If you lose your slave, if he runs away, or if he is killed, then uh, uh, we're going to compensate you for it. There was compensation. But what's happening with the Confederacy? Well, almost every planter, every planter and the son, wealthy planter, they have a man servant. So you got the senior officers of the Confederacy that have African Americans serving them while they're in meetings. While they're in meetings. African Americans are building Confederate fortifications. So they know the layout of every Confederate defensive plan because they built the fortifications. You have African Americans who are laying the railroad tracks, building the roads of the Confederacy. They know the entire transportation system of the Confederacy because they built the roads. They laid the railroad tracks. And they would move the equipment. They were teamsters. So they knew how much the Confederacy had in equipment because they're the ones moving it. Alan Pinkerton would observe that this was his best source of information. Before I get to Pinkerton, I do want to point out that you can see them with weapons. In fact, there are pickets. African Americans would with, with, with guns. Now remember, they enslaved person. They're still not soldiers. But you'll see them, especially those who are assumed to be the most loyal. Assumed to be the most loyal. But I do want to point out that Alan Pinkerton, Alan Pinkerton would write that he found that the best source of information was the colored men who were employed in various capacities of military nature, which entailed hard labor. Literally, what the Confederacy did is they embedded within their army informants for the Union cause. They embedded them within their army informants for the Union cause. But the, the, the biggest success early in the war for a spy network is actually in Maryland. In fact, the spy network in Maryland is so successful that one would lead to a, a rather incompetent general, now I'm, I, maybe I shouldn't say that because I kind of like the man, becoming the first hero of the Civil War, but also leads to President Lincoln lifting or suspending the writ of habeas corpus. Now, the president has no authority in time of rebellion to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. That means that when you, they're taking you down, you get to have a hearing and you get to find out what you're charged with. But in this case, that didn't happen when the mayor of Baltimore was arrested in May of 1861, when the chief of police of Baltimore. Lincoln, Congress isn't even in session, so Lincoln lifts, suspends the writ of habeas corpus. That, under the Constitution, Article 1, Section 9, Paragraph 2, is a congressional legislative authority. But Lincoln doesn't. And the general who benefits, or let us say who's responsible for this, is Benjamin Butler. The head of the National Police, General Lafayette Baker, would later write that Butler, though he might not have had great executive, uh, or excuse me, tactical or strategic uh, knowledge as a general, 
his executive power and what he does in keeping Maryland in the Union. But most importantly, what's happening with Butler, Butler is the beneficiary of a spy network whose spy master is Abraham Galloway. Abraham Galloway is an African American from North Carolina who William Steele would write about, and William Steele writes a book on the Underground Railroad. He was an African American conductor or secretary of the organization uh, in Philadelphia. And he would write of Abraham Galloway, Abraham Galloway allied himself faithfully to John Bull until Uncle Sam became involved with the contest with the rebels. Who is John Bull? He's the British equivalent to Uncle Sam. In fact, when you read William Steele's book on the Underground Railroad, anytime you had a physical specimen, a good soldier, a Sambo, come through, he would say, he's a specimen for John Bull, which means what? He's going to get military training in Canada. These are very competent men who come back down to the United States who had been in Canada. Abraham Galloway being one of them. And Galloway would be, as one soldier described it, described him, Butler's secret agent. <laughs> Butler would get promoted for keeping Maryland in the Union. He would be promoted to Major General and would be assigned to Fortress Monroe on the Virginia Peninsula. On the day that Virginia voted to secede to the Union, May 23rd, 1861, three men, Frank Baker, James Towson, and Shepard Maury, three enslaved men, came into Union lines seeking refuge. Butler gave them refuge. The very next day, a Confederate officer came in and asked Butler that this property be returned to them. Butler told the Confederate officer, well, you seceded from the Union. And you're basically using these men you claim as property in your efforts to wage war against the United States. So he says, I shall hold these Negroes as contraband of war. And so this term contraband that you see is confiscated property. These enslaved persons are claimed as property. So Butler, a lawyer from Massachusetts, is arguing that we can confiscate this property that's being used in the war against the Union, against the, the federal government. So he confiscates the property. And he says that the question is simply whether they shall be used for or against the government of the United States. We get this term contraband from Butler. This would be authorized by the War Department and Lincoln. And so the confiscation of property. Butler would also extend this refuge not only to those used for military purposes, but to their children as well. And so Fortress Monroe would become the first contraband camp located on the Virginia Peninsula. Lincoln had also called in April of 1861 for a special session of Congress. Remember, Congress was not in session when the war began. Congress was not scheduled to come into session until December of 1861. That would be the first session of the 37th Congress. But Lincoln called for a special session, July, 15, July 4th, 1861. And the first order of business in this, in this session of Congress was to come up with the object of the war. Why is the federal government going to war? The resolution in the Senate was drafted by a slaveholder from Tennessee by the name of Andrew Johnson. Senator Andrew Johnson. Though Tennessee had seceded from the Union by this time, in fact, by this time, July of 1861, 11 of the 15 slaveholding states, including Arkansas, had seceded from the Union. But Johnson retained his seat in the Senate and would draft the Senate resolution. The House resolution was drafted by John Crittenden, Representative John Crittenden, who had actually been in the Senate in the 36th Congress, but in the 37th Congress out of Kentucky, he, another slaveholder, was in the House. In fact, Crittenden was considered one of the elder statesmen. In fact, many, they, they would often say that if you want to know what the framers of the Constitution meant, you should ask Crittenden because he was so old he knew them all. <laughs> but in this object of the war, this joint resolution, that passed in July of 1861, they state very clear what the purpose for going to war is. It read, to maintain the supremacy of the Constitution and to preserve the Union and not to overthrow or interfere with slavery. President Lincoln affirmed this resolution. The federal objective of the Civil War was clear. The war was being fought to preserve the Union and not to end the tyranny of slavery. The paramount objective, to preserve the Union. Also, a major piece of legislation that passes in August of 1861 is the first Confiscation Act. Signed into law on April 6, 1861, in the first Confiscation Act, Congress authorizes the generals, the admirals, to confiscate the property. Do what Butler did. It gives legal sanction to what Butler did. But it's very specific here. It says that only those who are employed in some military capacity, 
So this does not apply to all enslaved persons. And even those enslaved persons that are confiscated as contraband of war, they're not necessarily free. In fact, the legislation reads that, that, that those, those who claim are simply forfeiting their claim to this individual. It doesn't say they're free. And if we want to appreciate those, some, uh, some scholars and even some Lincoln's contemporary will refer to this as, a, as emancipating enslaved persons, the interpretation of that by Lincoln will come to in a moment, but it's very clear that Lincoln did not believe that it, that it freed any slaves, that first confiscation act. When that first confiscation act is, uh, is signed into law, Frederick Douglass, in his monthly, is telling is speaking for the voice of the African American. Now, when we study Frederick Douglass, I want you really, scholars, I want you to appreciate this. When you study Frederick Douglass, I want you to appreciate you're not studying the operations of the loyal league, of the legal league. Frederick Douglass does not speak to African Americans. He speaks for African Americans. He speaks for them to America's European descent community. He is the public affairs officer, we call him in the, mil in the military, He's your G5, which means the general in charge of public affairs. Now, I'll tell you something. If you're trying to track a military unit and you track the public affairs, you won't know anything about that military unit. Because the public affairs is, deals in propaganda. It's trying to get you to support. And so what Douglas writes to European Americans in 1861, stating what the Loyal League believes, he says, we have very good evidence to the fact that the administration in Washington, the Lincoln administration, notwithstanding appearances, stands ready to enforce a policy in the rebellious states that will eventually abolish slavery in those rebellious states, quote, just as soon as the people required, close quote. Now what does he mean by as soon as the people require? The voice of the people in our federal government is Congress. As soon as Congress requires it. So Douglas is saying, I want you to go to work, and he says it specifically, lobbying Congress, send petitions to your congressman. Go to Washington if you can. Meet with your congressman to get the laws changed. They were trying to give Lincoln the laws to enforce. So often when you hear criticism of Lincoln, Lincoln didn't want to do it, Lincoln didn't do it. Lincoln was the executive. He was not the legislative branch. He did not make the laws. And if you want to understand Lincoln's interpretation of the First Confiscation Act, you look at what he does to General John C. Fremont. After the First Confiscation Act, Link, uh, Fremont, who's the commander of the Department of Missouri, would declare free slaves in the Department of Missouri, in Missouri. And Lincoln would tell him to rescind it, and he would tell him in an open letter that you've basically gone beyond the Confiscation Act. You've gone beyond the authority that Congress has given us. So it's very clear that this was not an emancipating act. It was a Confiscation Act of those who were employed for military purpose for the Confederacy, for the rebellion. And African Americans, they're actually counseling many of the anti-slavery elements that, hey, you know, I know President Lincoln says John S. Rock, he's been more conservative than I hoped him to be. But he goes on to say, but I know him to be an honest man, striving to fix these problems that Buchanan's administration left for us. And he says, I believe that this, this war means something. And emancipation is going to spring for it. And Rock would go on to say that I see God's finger in it. God has come down to deliver his people. That's what the League believed. They viewed Lincoln as an instrument of, not their Savior. They viewed him as an instrument of. And that the whole Republican Party is what they're working with. Through the legislative process first. And Lincoln, on March 6, 1861, would go to Congress. And he'd recommend, or let us say send a message to Congress, he'd recommend compensating emancipation. This is the first move that Lincoln is making toward emancipation in the war. On March 10th, Confederate, or not, not Confederates, correction, border state representatives and senators would come to Lincoln's office, come to the White House and meet with him. And Lincoln would tell them, I want you to support this resolution. Now they're very hesitant, they're saying no. But then William Hall, a representative of Kentucky, would ask Abraham Lincoln, uh, how do you feel about slavery? And Lincoln tells him, uh, uh, let us say, let, let, let's not say what Lincoln tells him. Let's say what the border state representatives and, and representatives said Lincoln told him. They said Lincoln said he did not pretend to disguise his anti-slavery feeling and that he thought it was wrong and should continue to think so. He said that it was an odious law that he was required to enforce by, by the Emancipation Party, allowing them to keep this property, these human beings they claimed as property, and that he was going to get rid of that odious law by inducements and propositions, which means compensation, inducements, and two propositions, legislation. Lincoln has a program. 
This key word legislation is important. Propositions, legislations. But Lincoln doesn't believe this is going to happen until it becomes a military necessity. So when did it become a military necessity? When could he convince the unconditional Union men that this was a military necessity to change this war into a war to end the tyranny of slavery? Well, in the spring of 1862, Union General George McClellan had assembled arguably the best trained and best equipped army in the world. It was certainly the largest army in the Western Hemisphere. McClellan trained his army in the Washington area. He would take his army down the Virginia Peninsula, march it up the Virginia Peninsula, and by the 1st of June, 1862, McClellan's army, the largest army in the Western Hemisphere, was within 10 miles of the rebel capital, Richmond, Virginia. African Americans were not happy about what's going on. They believed that if McClellan won the war at this time, slavery would not be tabled. Emancipation would not be discussed. The Union would be reserved without emancipation becoming a military necessity. And Susie King Taylor, a young girl from Savannah, Georgia, who had run away and uh, was at the contraband camp in Hilton Heads, South Carolina, she would write, and she, she learned to read and write at a secret school in Savannah. The Loyal League had a number of secret schools across this country. She learned to read and write there. She said that it was a gloomy day. The 1st of June, 1862, was a gloomy day because they thought there was going to be a resolution to the war. And when you look at what's, what happens in the club and what's happening in other places, you can see clearly that something went wrong in the Virginia Peninsula, in the intelligence world, in the spy network. And you compare what's going on in the Virginia Peninsula to what's going on in North Carolina, and at the same time on the General Ambrose Graham side, Burnside has a spy, spy master. What's his name? Abraham Galloway. Burnside, benefiting from Butler, who had captured Harris Island, North Carolina, because of Galloway and his spy network in 18, August 1861, Galloway was so good that he organized a group of fishermen in, South Car excuse me, in North Carolina. He put the Union Army on the fishermen's boats. And on April 23rd, 1862, these Union soldiers are on a boat. I'm going I'm to step out here. These Union soldiers are on a boat. And they go right by this Confederate fort, Fort Macon, in the early morning of April 23rd, 1862, before dawn. When the citizens of Beaufort, North Carolina, wake up the next day, they're occupied by the Union Army. Not a single shot was fired. Oh, Burnside was winning the intelligence war. Burnside was winning the intelligence war. In fact, the intelligence war with this loyal league throughout this country in Memphis, New Orleans, Sea Islands of South Carolina, Northeastern North Carolina, Huntsville, Nashville, a lot of success. But let's go back to the Virginia Peninsula. On the Virginia Peninsula, if McClellan captures Richmond, remember the war is over. Slavery will not be tabled. Pinkerton is the top guy. He's McClellan's guy for intelligence. Pinkerton lets us know that he's hiring a number of African Americans. In this photograph, you'll see one of the African Americans working for Pinkerton. We don't know if that African American is indeed John Scoble, but we know that Pinkerton writes about John Scoble, saying that John Scoble was his man, that he disclosed the nature and objects of the Loyal League to Pinkerton and his men. In fact, Scoble had taken one of Pinkerton's top operatives, Timothy Webster, to a meeting of the Loyal League in Leonardtown, Maryland, where the national president spoke. Where the national president spoke. John Scoble was in a hotel room in April of 1862 with Timothy Webster and Hattie Lawton, two of Pinkerton's officers, when they were arrested. John Scoble was not arrested. Scoble and the Loyal League becomes the principal source of intelligence for Pinkerton, therefore, for McClellan during the Peninsula Campaign. And on June 1st, 1862, when he was 10 miles within, within Richmond, 10 miles from Richmond, General Robert E. Lee took command of the Confederate forces in defense of Richmond. General Lee's army was less than half the size of McClellan's army. But Lee was able to deceive McClellan to believing that his army was four times its actual size. Lee was able to deceive McClellan to believe that wooden cannons, often referred to as Quaker guns, were indeed real cannons. Now, they were called Quaker guns because they were ultimately peaceful or friendly guns. They were simply logs and could not fire anything. <laughs> but Lee was able to deceive McClellan into believing they were real cannons. Lee deceived and outmaneuvered McClellan. Lee, Lee won the intelligence battle. He won the intelligence battle in 1862. And when word gets to Washington, the McClellan's army, the largest army in the Western Hemisphere, was in full retreat, suffering a humiliating defeat. 
In July of 1862, Congress passed the Militia Act of 1862, granting President Lincoln the authority to employ persons of African descent in any military capacity for which he saw fit. This legislation, born of military necessity, after McClellan's army had been forced to withdraw along the Virginia Peninsula, was not the only important piece of legislation on President Lincoln's desk that day, July 17, 1862. The other important piece of legislation is known as the Second Confiscation Act. In Section 6 of the Second Confiscation Act, Congress gave President Lincoln the authority to seize, to confiscate, to take all property of persons in states of rebellion. Those held as slaves are claimed as property. Lincoln is being given the authority to confiscate, to take all slaves in states of rebellion. In Section 9 of the Second Confiscation Act, Congress declared forever free all persons held as slaves by supporters of the rebellion. President Lincoln signed both these pieces of legislation into law on the 17th of July, 1862. He then had the legal authority to arm men of African descent, to bring them into the army, and to declare free slaves in states in rebellion. But remember this legislation? This legislation said that if you have claimed this property by support of the rebellion, you're forever free. Thousands of African Americans would seek freedom at that time. The first emancipation date to be celebrated in the Civil War is July 17th. Those from Arkansas that can make it to Leavenworth, Kansas, a contraband camp, or can make it to Memphis, Tennessee, another contraband camp, they were forever free, based on an act of Congress. Five days after signing this legislation into law, Lincoln met with his cabinet. He informed his cabinet members that he was ready to issue an emancipation proclamation immediately, acting on the authority that Congress had given him. He gave a draft of his proclamation to his cabinet members and asked for their advice. One of his cabinet members, Solomon Chase, Secretary of Treasury, advised President Lincoln not, excuse me, advised President Lincoln to add stronger language in his proclamation concerning the arming of men of African descent. Another of his cabinet members, Secretary of State William Seward, advised President Lincoln not to issue the proclamation at that time. Now, Secretary Seward was an abolitionist out of New York. He wanted to see slavery abolished. He supported emancipation. He was Harriet Tubman's benefactor. He helped finance the Underground Railroad. Indeed, he himself had assisted some on escaping along the Underground Railroad. Yet, in July of 1862, he's advising President Lincoln not to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Why? Congressional elections are coming up. And Secretary Seward tells President Lincoln, we've just suffered the greatest disasters of the war. And if you issue this proclamation now, after those humiliating defeats, quote, it will be viewed in the mind of the people as the last measure of an exhausted government, a cry for help, the government stretching out its hands unto Ethiopia instead of Ethiopia stretching out her hands unto the government, close quote. Ethiopia was commonly used to refer to African Americans in the 1800s. Secretary Seward is telling President Lincoln that if we issue this proclamation now, the voters are going to view it as a cry for help to the Negroes. And he advises President Lincoln to wait for a military success a victory on the battlefield that would mask, that would hide this cry for help to African Americans. President Lincoln calling the proclamation a practical war measure, considered Secretary Seward's advice wise advice. Now, a prudent president takes wise advice. Lincoln waited to claim his victory. He would claim his victory on the bloodiest day in American history. Not the bloodiest battle in American history, but the bloodiest day in American history. September 17, 1862, a battle about 85 miles northwest of Washington near Sharpsburg, Maryland. Officially, it is called the Battle of Antietam. In 12 hours, 22,000 casualties. Well, over half of these 22,000 casualties were Union soldiers, Lincoln soldiers. But the rebels, the Confederates under Robert E. Lee, withdrew from the battlefield. So the Union army under George McClellan claimed a victory. And five days later, September 22, 1862, President Lincoln issued the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, in which he warned the states in rebellion that if they did not lay down their arms and return to the Union in the next 100 days, by January 1, 1863, he was going to declare free their slaves. Mm. Well, the rebels did not believe that Lincoln and the Union Army could make good this threat because they believed they were winning the war. They called the Battle of Antietam the Battle of Sharpsburg and a draw, a tie, not a defeat. Viewed as a part of a larger military campaign where General Lee's army under Stonewall Jackson, General Thomas J. Jackson, had captured Harper's Ferry. If you have a victory and a tie, you call it a victory. And that's exactly what the Confederacy did. But the Northern press focused exclusively on that battle in Sharpsburg, calling it the Battle of Antietam and a Union victory, giving President Lincoln, more specifically the Republican candidates in the 1862 congressional elections, some political cover. And I do want to point out that President Lincoln's party, the Republican Party, even though it lost 21 seats in the House of Representatives, retained the majority in the House and in the Senate in the 1862 congressional elections. So the decision by President Lincoln to wait for a military success before issuing his Emancipation Proclamation was indeed a prudent, a prudent political decision. Meanwhile, Solomon P. Chase, Secretary of Treasury, 
He tells he, he tells Lincoln to add stronger language, advise him to add stronger language concerning the arming of men about his sin. Chase would write a letter to Benjamin Butler. And he would tell Butler that south of Memphis, in this part of the woods, that the only way that you're going to be able to open up the, the Lincoln beliefs, the only way you're going to be able to keep that Mississippi River open, to open it up, is with the help of the black defenders. You're going to have to go to the African American population to, to, to open up the Mississippi. That's what Chase tells Butler. Butler is now the commander of the Department of the Gulf in New Orleans. And he goes on to tell Butler that, uh, that he believes that the only way the Gulf states are going to be retained is with the help of, of its African descent population. And he goes on to tell Butler that if it was him, he would do what General Andrew Jackson did in the War of 1812 and call on colored soldiers to defend the Union. Butler does just that. And the first regiment of African descent was mustered into federal service in September of 1862, before the Emancipation Proclamation. Among those men mustered in were not just men from Louisiana, actually enough. Pitchback, who I have there in the corner, Pitney Benton Stewart Pitchback became a captain in the Union Army, and he was not from Louisiana. He would later become governor of Louisiana, America's first African descent governor, for 43 days, but he was actually from Cincinnati, Ohio when the war began. But he's down there, why? Because the Loyal League had this kind of movement. And he's down there, he's a major saboteur down in Louisiana. In fact, the first two regiments mustered into federal service were Louisiana regiments. The first and second Louisiana Native Guard and all 60 of the line officers, captains and lieutenants, were men of African descent. Now I can't tell you how many scholars will tell you there were no African American officers during the Civil War, when in fact, the first two regiments mustered in, all 60 of the line officers, captains and lieutenants, were men of African descent. I can't tell you how many scholars I've read that the first African American to command U.S. soldiers was sometime in the 1880s. No, it wasn't. It was in 1862. All the company commanders were men of African descent. All the company commanders. They were commanding troops. And on October 25th, 1862, under General Godfrey Weitzel, they captured Donaldsonville, Louisiana. Butler would say, I observed something very remarkable about them. They learned to handle arms and to march more easily than intelligent white men. They were impressive soldiers from the beginning. In South Carolina, there had been a regiment illegally organized under General David Hunter that was disbanded in, uh, in June of 1862. It was disbanded because it was illegal. It was before the Militia Act was passed. August of 1862, General Rufus Saxon was ordered to reorganize this regiment. Now, I've heard some people say the reason they had red pants is because the federal government wouldn't give them uniforms because they were Negro soldiers. That's not true. The reason they had red pants is because when they were illegally organized, they could not requisition uniforms from the quartermaster department. So how did they get their uniforms? They were donated to them by the New York Zorbs who wore red pantaloons or red pants. That's why they have the red pants. These are donated uniforms. These men, however, in the fall of 1862 would be organized and ready to run patrols with Prince Rivers, an African American who later becomes a general in the South Carolina State Militia after the Civil War, so I'm going to refer to him as General Prince Rivers. These men are so competent that Thomas Whitworth Higginson, who commands the regiment, would write, we, their officers, did not go there to teach lessons but to receive them. And in 1862, the fall of 1862, they're actively running patrols down the coast of Georgia and Florida. Highly successful raids. In today's military vernacular, we call these special operations raids. These are highly competent soldiers. Highly competent soldiers. And in this neck of the woods, in the Department of the West, in Kansas, Senator James Lane had organized a regiment in August of 1862. And that regiment, made up of men from the Indian Territories, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Missouri, and from those few that are in Kansas, they would fight near Butler, Missouri on October 29, 1862, the skirmish or battle at Island Mound. And a Harvest Weekly reporter would note that under the most unfavorable circumstances they fought, but they re it resulted in a complete victory for the Negro regiment. My point here is that before the Emancipation Proclamation is issued, African American soldiers have been successful on the battlefield. Lincoln knew this. Grant knew this. Any officer who was observing it, just like Bear Bryant knew that African Americans could play football in 1968, so did the generals know that African Americans could fight. 
On January 1, 1863, President Lincoln issued the final Emancipation Proclamation as, quote, a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion, close quote. I want you to pay close attention to the President's language within the proclamation. He does not pretend that this is a moral or humanitarian document. He's explicit. He's clear. It's a fit and necessary war measure for what? For accomplishing the paramount objective of the war, which was to preserve the Union. And in this fit and necessary war measure for preserving the Union, President Lincoln declared forever free all persons held as slaves in the 10 states, not in the 15 states, but in the 10 states that were at war with the United States for their independence on January 1, 1863. In the five slaveholding states that accepted Abraham Lincoln as president, federal authority, the Emancipation Proclamation did not apply because Congress did not give the president the authority to seize property and declare free slaves in states that were loyal to the Union. Only in states in rebellion. Only in states that had to be brought back to the Union by military conquest. But remember, the army needs help. In the Emancipation Proclamation is where President Lincoln issues his public order to his field commanders to receive men of African descent into all armed services of the United States. This cry for help is so well masked, so well hidden, that in the 21st century, we still have many teachers simply teaching President Lincoln freed the slaves on January 1, 1863. No, President Lincoln declared free slaves in states that were in a bloody war against the United States for their independence. The only way the enslaved would be set free in the states in rebellion is that the Union had to be preserved. The paramount objective of the war had to be accomplished. The soldiers and sailors that we are answered a cry for help from the federal government and by helping to save the Union, they enforce the Emancipation Proclamation, therefore becoming the liberators, the emancipators of themselves and their own families. Their story has been one of the best kept secrets in American history. Martin Delaney would write to the War Department in 1863 and tell them, we are able, sir, to command all the affected black men as agents in the United States. This is a national organization. And if we want to appreciate just how important this national organization was, we need only follow the general who wins the war, General Ulysses S. Grant. General Grant would begin his Vicksburg campaign. Now, Lincoln had called Vicksburg the key to victory. Grant began his Vicksburg campaign in the fall of 1862. There, you see that one star in northern, northern Mississippi? That's Oxford, Mississippi. That's where Grant's supply depot was. Grant would complain in the fall of 1862 that the rebels operating in his, in his theater were like ghosts. They appeared and disappeared on him. He didn't know where they came from or where they went. In other words, he has very poor intelligence. Indeed, on Christmas Eve, 1862, Gen Confederate General Earl Van Dorn's cavalry would attack Grant's supply depot. Actually, I should say Holly Springs, Mississippi. I, I misspoke. It's near Holly Springs, Mississippi. I don't know why I'm in Mississippi on my mind. Maybe that protest the other day. But anyway, it's Holly Springs, Mississippi. He attacks Van Dorn attacks, destroys, and commandeers $1.2 million worth of supplies. Now, this was a surprise attack. Scholars, I want you to appreciate that if somebody conducts a surprise attack with you with a cavalry division, you have very poor intelligence. You have very poor information on whether they're like ghosts. They're appearing and disappearing on you. Grant had to can cancel his Vicksburg campaign. He would renew his Vicksburg campaign after January 1, 1863. And oh, did things get different. They were so different that a double agent, an African-American spy, was able to inform Confederate General John Pemberton that Grant was going to attack north through the Yazoo swamps. Well, General Sherman did a demonstration, and, and Pemberton oriented his, his forces north based on this false information. Meanwhile, Grant would maneuver his army down the Louisiana side of the river and cross over at a place called Bruinsburg, Mississippi, uncharted. None of Grant's survey officers, map makers, knew anything about this landing. How did Grant find out about it? An elderly colored man told him. One of those league operatives. It's a pristine land. And Grant is 15 miles into Mississippi before the rebels even know he's there. And Grant would boast in May of 1863 that he knew what the rebels were doing deep within the South before they even did. It went from their ghosts to I can read their minds. What's the difference? Well, in military terms, you're going to have to provide me some real information. I don't believe he's reading minds. There's an intelligence network, the four L's, Lincoln's Legal Loyal League is at work for Grant in the Mississippi Valley, and Grant now knows what the Confederacy is doing before they even do it. Indeed, when the Confederates tried to reinforce their garrison at, at, uh, at Vicksburg in June of 1863, and the African Brigade organized at Milligan's Bend, though the regiment
but not mentioned here is the first Arkansas infantry of African descent. The first Arkansas infantry was being organized at the time this battle occurs. So most of these are Louisiana regiments that are there. And uh, they are outnumbered almost three to one. And with the help of naval gunfire, though ill, they're, they're not armed well. In fact, it's mostly hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's almost 36 hours of hand-to-hand -hand combat. But they repulsed the Confederate force. And the Battle of Milliken's Bend, later Grant would say that Vicksburg could not have been captured when it was without the help and the bravery of these African descent soldiers. And Grant would write to President Lincoln in August of 1863, one month after capturing Vicksburg. July 4th, 1863, Grant secured the key to victory. And Grant would write to President Lincoln, quote, by arming the Negro, we have added a powerful ally, close quote. You notice the general didn't say by freeing the Negro, did he? He said by army. He didn't say we simply added more bodies to our army. He said we've added what? A powerful ally. Difference makers on the battlefield. And in 1863, whether we're talking about battlefields in what was known as the Western Theater, Port Hudson in Louisiana, or on battlefields in what was known as the Eastern Theater, Fort Wagner in South Carolina, African American soldiers not only demonstrated that they could and would fight, they demonstrated that they could and would fight well. Meanwhile, with the Confederacy, you have these African Americans traveling with the Confederacy, right? They're embedded. Now they have reason to tell on Lee. So can Lee, in 1863, deceive the Union Army, making them think his force is four times their actual size? Can Lee do this? Can Lee use wooden cannons, Quaker guns? Well, let's read Lee. Read, Lee writes to his, the commander of the 16th Virginia Cavalry, his counterintelligence officer. He tells him, quote, the chief source of information to our enemy comes through our Negroes. Close quote. Now, I spent 21 years in the Marine Corps as an artillery and intelligence officer, and I tell you what, if you told me that I knew where a chief source of information to my enemy was coming, I was going to stop that. I'm going to stop it. Lee tries to stop it, but let's listen to his solution. His solution, this is how he tried to stop it. They can be easily deceived with proper precaution. In other words, they're not very bright. They don't have colon pies. They, 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 they won't be able to figure it out. He did not understand that he was dealing with an organization that had trained people before the war. Many of us today, when we study the Civil War, don't understand that. Lee didn't understand it either. And so that was his solution. And when Lee is moving his army from Culpeper, Virginia, north, his destination is Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Harrisburg is the major logistical depot for the north. Almost all the equipment that comes to the north by rail comes through Harrisburg. It's the major hub. If Lee can make it to Harrisburg and capture Harrisburg, he's got a bonanza of supplies. Mm -hmm. However, while his army is on the move, an African-American operative by the name of Charlie Wright comes into Union lines. And he's interviewed by Captain John McGinty of the BMI, the Bureau of Military Information, that would be the CIA or DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, of the Civil War established by General Joseph Hooker, commanded by General George Sharp. McGinty would report that Charlie Wright provided him outstanding information. It was Charlie Wright's information that puts the Union Army in motion and Pleasant's, Pleasanton's cavalry when they engaged Lee's army near a place called Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. That's a chance engagement that turns into a full-fledged battle. And the only reason the Union is present there is because of good intelligence. In fact, it is often said that after this battle, George Meade, the Union commander, knew more about Lee's army than he did, than Lee did. Look at the change in fortunes and intelligence. And what is the deciding factor? The Emancipation Proclamation, that fit and necessary war measure, had changed the fortunes of Union intelligence, and Lee can no longer continue to win the intelligence battles. He loses them consistently through the end of the war because the chief source of information to his enemy came through the Confederate Negroes. By the end of 1863, Lincoln's War Department is really talking up these soldiers. In their message to Congress, they would say that the slave had proved his manhood. And he would go on to argue not only can they fight infantry, they've proven that, they can use artillery, they can fight in cavalry, that was... Ed Whitfield, he was the third, 
third U.S. Colored Cavalry, the first Mississippi Cavalry. In fact, in this, they talk about Company A on a raid. I didn't include this on the slide, but that was his company. So he was on the raid that they're talking about. That's my great great grandfather. That's our, our, our ancestor who was with the third Mississippi. So they can fight in all the branches. And they're making it very clear. And in this, in this message, they go on to say, and that, that law, the Militia Act of 1862, which awarded them unequal pay, Lincoln's War Department is saying they need to, that, pay, that needs to be amended because they've proven their manhood on the battlefield and they need to get equal pay. Meanwhile, here in Arkansas, in Arkansas, General Herbert is telling President Lincoln that there's some unconditional union men here and literally, Arkansas, the northern part of Arkansas, it, it is moving quickly toward Union. You've got African-American regiments that are being organized at this time in Helena and in Fort Smith. And there's a pincher literally going on in Little Rock. And by the end of the year, there in Little Rock, you actually have African-American regiments being organized in Little Rock, Arkansas. They become a part of the occupying force in Little Rock, Arkansas. In Arkansas, you have the first state in rebellion, those 10 states in rebellion, the first state in rebellion to be brought back in the Union, thus, guess who led the way to emancipation through the Emancipation Proclamation? Arkansas. Remember what Delaney said? You're ahead of the other states. Indeed, in 1859, he told us they were going to be ahead of the other states. And indeed, they were ahead of the other states. And how many of you celebrate Juneteenth? Here in Arkansas, shame on you. Shame on you. And I'll get more into that. What you ought to be celebrating in Arkansas is the day 10,000 people marched down the street in Little Rock on April 11th, 1864, celebrating when Isaac Murphy was inaugurated as the, as the Union governor. You got 10,000, you got free persons, African Americans, celebrating. Why? Because the Emancipation Proclamation is the law in Arkansas at this time. This is going to be a free state. So if you want to celebrate your emancipation, you ought to celebrate April 11th. April 11th, 1864. I hope to come back here. That's your day. That's your day. And there are U.S. colored troops in. So you ought to have some people in uniform, reenactors. There are United States colored troops in Little Rock, Arkansas on April 11, 1864. Meanwhile, back west, back east, General Ulysses S. Grant has been, been named General in Chief of the Army. He's now the top general in the Army. He arrived in Washington, March 1864, and there were zero, no United States colored troops in the Army of the Potomac. The jewel of the Union Army, that army responsible for the defense of Washington, the principal army that attempts to capture Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy. General Grant would immediately begin transferring United States colored troop regiments from other regions of the country into the Virginia theater. Why? General Grant wants his powerful allies on the battlefield in the most important campaign in the war, the campaign to capture Richmond, Virginia. By the middle of 1864, African American soldiers had captured and occupied a portion of every state in rebellion to include the state of Texas. Yes, to include the state of Texas. By the middle, in fact, when did they capture the southern tip of Texas? November 1863. So whoever said the word of the Emancipation Proclamation didn't get to Texas until June 19, 1865. They are uninformed on the history. This has been one of the best kept secrets in American history. African American soldiers are in Texas, five regiments of the Corps d'Afrique. In fact, in the congressional record, Stanton actually tells the congressional record, let's, let's go through this, because you know y'all, in, in Arkansas, y'all got a state law that says the word of the proclamation didn't get to, to uh, Texas to June 19, 1865. Right there in the state capitol, somebody, an African American legislator, helped that lie go into law. Yes, it's a lie. Yeah. Let's listen to what Stanton says, December 5th, 1863. In the state of Texas, the flag of the Union has, during the whole war, been upheld by a small force at Franklin, so that the rebels have never succeeded in wholly excluding federal authority from the state. Franklin's almost in the center of Texas. Wait, we, yet we're talking about the word of the proclamation doesn't get to Texas until June 19, 1865. One of the best kept secrets in American history is the story of what really went on in the Civil War in the enforcement of the Emancipation Proclamation. You weren't freed by hearing about the proclamation. You were freed by the enforcement. That's why Arkansas is the first to be emancipated on the Emancipation Proclamation because this is the first state to be forcibly brought back in the Union. Hmm. That's how the proclamation worked. It had to be enforced. These are the five regiments that were in Texas in December of 1863. In 1864, you get 
regiments from, from New York, African American regiments, from Missouri, stationed in Texas. African American soldiers served in every branch of the army. They were in the infantry, they were in the, in the cavalry, horse soldiers, artillery, firing the cannons, musicians. In today's military, the soldier that does the job of the field musician, the drummer boy, we call him a field radio operator or communicator. The field musician, the drummer boy, did not have to know how to play music. He had to know what the series of beats meant for each command so that he could relay the commands of the commander. He was a signalman. Very important job for our young drummer boys. Average age of a drummer boy during the Civil War was 15 years old. Youngest drummer boy to serve was Elijah Mason of the 114th United States Colored Troops. And when he enlisted in 1864 at Camp Nelson, Kentucky, he was eight years old. He was the youngest soldier to serve in the Civil War, Elijah Mason, 114th United States Colored Troops. African Americans served as pioneers. In today's military, we call a pioneer in the Army of the Marine Corps, combat engineer. In the Navy, we call him a CB. These are combat construction workers. Now, I've heard any time they talk about African American soldiers doing manual labor, I've actually heard people say, and they were doing menial tasks. I am still trying to figure out what a menial task is in a combat zone. Yeah. Right. I spent 21 years in the Marine Corps. You tell my Marines, I tell them to go out and dig, I'm going to use an army term, a latrine, and you say, oh, that's a menial task. No, it isn't. That's sanitary conditions in the camp. <laughs> That's an important task. There are no menial tasks in a combat zone. Maybe it's to shine your boots. They weren't shining boots. Pioneers, combat construction workers, very important to a fighting army. Pioneers, as they were called in the Civil War. And African Americans served as sailors. 25% of the U.S. Navy was comprised of African American sailors. Now, I've heard some people say, well, you know, in World War II, they were only cooks and stewards. So surely in the Civil War, they were only cooks and stewards. That's 1862, right? So they only cooks and stewards. Listen, if 25% of your Navy is cooks or cooks and stewards, you don't have a fighting Navy, you have a cruise line. <laughs> they had a whole range of duties. They were cooks, stewards, navigators, engineer officers, firemen, boatsmen, mates, landsmen, seamen, whole range of duties. The first African American to receive the Medal of Honor, the highest honor given to American military personnel for acts of courage on the battlefield, was Robert Blake, a sailor. He received his medal on April 16, 1864, becoming the first African American to receive our nation's highest military honor. He was one of seven African American sailors to receive the Medal of Honor for acts of courage during the Civil War. All seven of those African American sailors received their medal within six months of the acts of act of courage on the Civil War. Uh, of acts of courage on the battlefield, on the ship. This is really rapid. An appreciation for their courage in battle. There were 18 African American soldiers who received the Medal of Honor for acts of courage during the Civil War, bringing our total to 25. African American sailors again distinguished themselves, and there were five African American women who actually legally enlisted in the Navy. They served aboard a hospital ship that worked the Mississippi River called the Red Rover. One of them, Anna Stokes, lived a good long life and she would receive a pension. That's in the Navy, legally, five African American women. In the Army, African American women who serve as nurses are contracted. They're kind of like Halliburton, if you will. But they're contracted through the U.S. Sanitary Commission, we call it the Red Cross today. And they would contract nurses, and they earned quite an enviable reputation. However, I've often read that African American soldiers received inferior medical assistance during the Civil War. In fact, there's books written on this, and that's absolutely false. In fact, when you look at the book written on it by a distinguished scholar from Duke University, she actually argues that it's death by disease that proves that they received inferior medical services. Well, first, disease is the consequence of sanitation conditions in your camp not the delivery of medical services. Mm -hmm. And if you compare three-year regiments to three-year regiments, you find that European-American soldiers and African-American soldiers died at the same rate. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a nine-month regiment, you don't have enough time. You get out before you die of your disease. Mm -hmm. So you need to look at this data, but, and also, 19th century medicine, they didn't know how to treat most of these diseases, they mostly used quarantine. Mm -hmm. What is the best measure of the delivery of medical services? Survival of wounds. African American soldiers survived with their wounds at a higher rate than any soldiers in the Civil War. That's the statistical fact. But when we say racism prevented them from getting good medical services, what did we just do? We suppressed the story of our African descent mothers who were the finest nurses, among the finest nurses in the Civil War. You're suppressing your own story by not telling the truth.
by focusing on racism instead of achievement. One of the best kept secrets in the Civil War, in American history. Also, some women serve as guide scouts and spies. The most famous of these guide scouts and spies is Harriet Tubman. She would lead a raid in, in South Carolina in June of 1863 down the Cumbai River. Rather famous raid, and still to this day, she's the only Amer one, American woman in our history ever to lead U.S. soldiers on a raid. Now, I'll give you another example of racism, though, of where the racist analysis. Harriet Tubman was up for a pension in the 1890s. They refused her a pension. She was already receiving a pension of $12 a month because her husband had, was deceased and he was a Union soldier. If they had given Harriet Tubman a pension in her own right, she would have gotten $7 a month. She was already receiving $12. However, you listen to anybody tell you about Harriet Tubman other than Harry Jones, they will tell you that it was racism that prevented her from getting her pension. No, it wasn't. That was her friends. Her friends did not want to decrease, decrease her salary by almost 50%. So what did they do? They put on the official record, they actually, because their friends didn't want us in posterity to mistake their voting against it as saying she was not a guide scout and spy, they put in the official record, you have a House resolution stating that Harriet Tubman was a guide scout and spy in the Civil War. Mm. That's an act of good legislation. Mm. Compassionate legislation. African Americans served in every major campaign in the last year of the war. However, if you go to William Tecumseh Sherman, they'll say that William Tecumseh Sherman was such a racist. This man from Ohio was such a racist, he wasn't about to use African American soldiers. That's like saying Woody Hayes wouldn't use African American football players in Ohio State. And let's evaluate Sherman. What they'll say is that during his Atlanta campaign, Sherman didn't bring any Negroes with him. And when you read Sherman's letters to his wife, I'm telling you, he sounds like a racist. But again, I come from a military background. I'm an intelligence officer. I don't read letters to your wife to tell me everything. If I had a choice between letters to your right, wife and your operations order, I'm going to choose the operations orders. I'm going to choose the operations orders every time. But Sherman does write a letter to his enemy, Confederate General John Hood. And he tells Hood, we have no Negro allies in this army. Not a single Negro soldier left Chattanooga with this army or is with it now. That's what he wrote to his enemy in September of 1864. Now let me emphasize again, that's what he wrote to his enemy. Meanwhile, the 16th Army Corps pioneers, their names are on our wall of honor in Washington, D.C. They were with Sherman's army. The 16th Army Corps Pioneer Battalion Division, again, their names are on our wall of honor. This 110th United States Colored Troops, they're with Sherman's army. But you know what Sherman did to them? He took their uniforms away from them. I've read scholars that said, and shame on Sherman. He took their uniforms away from them. These men were from northern Georgia and northern Alabama. Guess what he did? He took their uniforms from them. He sent them in, deep cover. We call, it, we call them lurks, long-range reconnaissance patrollers, if he hadn't taken their uniforms away from them. After he took their uniforms, they're no longer long-range reconnaissance patrollers. They're secret agents. Right. So what was Sherman supposed to tell his enemy? Uh, I, I, I took the Negroes with me as secret agents. <laughs> He's talking to his enemy. Of course you tell your enemy, I have no Negroes with me if I have them in as secret agents. That's what Sherman told him. And also the 1st Alabama Cavalry, that's an integrated regiment. And it's in they're in charge of Sherman's headquarters security. Sherman got close to him. Also, Sherman would write of his Atlanta campaign, the great question of the campaign was one of supplies. Nashville, our chief depot, was itself partially in a hostile country, and even the routes of supply from Louisville to Nashville by rail and by the Cumberland River had to be guarded. Sherman would assign eight United States Colored Troop regiments to guard his supply lines. He said that the great question is one of supplies, and then he assigned African Americans to address the great question. Now again, I spent 21 years in the Marine Corps. You have know, General Boom says, Captain Jones, this is the great question. Well, let me see my worst Marines then, sir. <laughs> No, I'm not. Yeah. I'm going to send the people that can address the great question. Mm. And we even go further. In Atlanta, we actually have African-American corporal, a photograph of him in September of 1864. Yet, the narrative that's presented is that Sherman was such a racist, he didn't use African-American soldiers. But let's look at the end of it. Sherman actually would write, in his memoirs, I doubt whether the history of war can furnish more examples of skill and bravery than attended to the defense of the rail from Nashville to Atlanta during the year 1864. These are African Americans that guarded his rail line. What did he just say? He said, I doubt whether the, the history of warfare can furnish you better examples of skill and bravery than the African American soldiers. These United States Colored Troops. 
That's the truth. But that's not in the narrative presented by leading scholars in this country. This story remains one of the best kept secrets in American history. Now, by September of 1864, the Confederacy is coming to the understanding that they need African Americans on their football team. I mean, on their on their on their on, on their side. So the governor of Indiana, excuse me, the governor of Louisiana, Henry Allen, would write a letter to Secretary of War James Said. And in this letter dated September 26, 1864, he tells Secretary Seddon, in the coming session of the legislature, I want you to support the legislation concerning the arming of Negroes. And he goes on to tell him, quote, we have learned from nearby experience that Negroes can be taught to fight, close quote. In other words, they've been whipping us out here. I do not want a discussion on whether Negroes can fight or not. We have learned by dear bought experience that Negroes can be taught to fight. Now that does remind me of an incident in Alabama. Late 1960s. Supreme Court told the governor of Alabama, the University of Alabama, they had to let African Americans register at the University of Alabama. The governor of Alabama, George Wallace, stood in front of the registrar's office and would not allow them to enter the school and register. On a fall afternoon, one Saturday afternoon, John McKay's USC Trojans came into Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Sam the Band Cunningham, Randall Cunningham's older brother, ran all over Alabama that day, over 230 yards, three touchdowns, and the very next day, Bear Bryant was in Montgomery, Alabama, and told George Wallace, we've learned from nearby experience that Negroes can play football. <laughs> University of Alabama, you know what it looks like ever since. And it was very clear that the Confederacy was going to move toward enlisting men of Africa City into the Confederate Army. That was going to happen. And what does Martin Delaney do? He goes to Washington. And he meets with President Lincoln. And he tells President Lincoln that that part of the Underground Railroad, known only unto ourselves, our secret society, can prevent enlistment into the Confederacy. But in order for us to be most effective, the leadership to be most effective, you should assign us positions commissioned equal to our abilities. He then proceeded to hand President Lincoln letters of recommendation. President Lincoln told Delaney, I don't need any letters of recommendation from you. I know all about you. Indeed, Lincoln had been receiving letters about Delaney about Delaney over a, year, over a year before this meeting. Lincoln proceeds to order the Secretary of War Edwin Stanton to commission Martin Delaney as a Major of Infantry in the U.S. Army Regulars. I want you to appreciate the significance of this commission. There were 151 African American commissioned officers who served during the Civil War. 150 of them were in the U.S. Army Volunteers. Only one was in the U.S. Army Regulars. That's Delaney's commission. Most regular officers are West Point graduates. All right. okay. Delaney is also the only African American officer to command known African American officer. I won't get into the other part of it because there are some who are passing. He's the only known African American officer in his day to command his own regiment. He commanded the 104th United States Colored Troops out of South Carolina. When Delaney was marching out of the War Department, a newly commissioned major in February of 1865, cannons were going off in Washington. D Delaney turned to the Secretary of War and asked, Mr. Secretary, why are the cannons going off? Stan replied, Major Charleston, the cradle of secession, has been captured. Charleston, South Carolina, was captured on February 18, 1865, by United States Colored Troop Regiments. It is an indisputable historical fact that American soldiers of African descent captured and occupied the cradle of secession. Charleston, South Carolina. Now that's headline news. Well reported in the newspaper in February 1865, it's in the official records, but I challenge you to find it in a single American history textbook today. Mm. In fact, I challenge you to, to read it by a leading scholar. In fact, what the, most of them will say is that Charleston was not captured. It was occupied. Mm. Now that's like in the Marine Corps, we've been trying to take a hill. We've been dying trying to take that hill, and all of a sudden we chase the, the enemy, the bad guys off the hill, and we occupy it, so you say we didn't catch it. <laughs> it's, 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 this boy is all ridiculous, but you, you'll get this from leading scholars, and those same scholars will say that Atlanta was captured. Y'all know the Confederates evacuated Atlanta too. <laughs> this inconsistency is notable. African American soldiers captured the cradle of secession, Charleston, South Carolina, February 18, 1865. And by the spring of 1865, 33% of the Army of the Potomac was comprised of United States Colored Troop Regiments. Remember when General Grant got there? When General Grant, spring of 64, it's zero. One year later, it's 33%. Why? Grant wants his powerful allies on the battlefield, the most important campaign in the war. And he places African American soldiers on the front lines in front of Richmond. And why are they on the front lines? Because in September of 1864, they had captured the closest position to, 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 to Richmond. That's why they're on the front lines. 
On the general Butler on September 29th, September 30th, 1864, they capture New Market Heights, Chafin Farms, closest position, 14 Medal of Honor recipients from that battle. I've also heard many scholars say, well, the, you know, the real reason they were on the front lines is because, you know, these generals were racist. And these racist generals put these African-American soldiers on the front lines because they thought these were their worst soldiers, so they were sending their worst soldiers in first so they could get killed. They were cannon fodder. This is common. It's a common statement. I spent 21 years in the Marine Corps. In the Marine Corps, we boast of going in first. Why? Because we're the best. <laughs> in the Army, the 82nd Airborne goes in first. Why? Because they're the best. 101st Airborne goes in first. Why? Because they're the best. That's American military doctrine. And I challenge you to find a single American military figure, a single American general who has ever written, we send our worst in first. <laughs> That's like finding a football or basketball coach and always send the worst players in first. No, he doesn't. He's trying to win the game. And war is more important than football or basketball. And these soldiers say that the evidence of General Grant's confidence in their skill and bravery was the fact that he put them on the front lines in front of Richmond. General Grant writes in his memoirs that on April 3, 1865, the 25th Army Corps captured Richmond, Virginia. Ladies and gentlemen, scholars, the 25th Army Corps is the only Army Corps in American history comprised of only African American regiments. According to General Grant's order of battle, it is an indisputable historical fact that American soldiers of African descent captured and occupied the capital of the Confederacy, Richmond, Virginia. Now that's headline news. Challenge you to find the single American history textbook today. We're well reported in the newspapers of 1865, of April 1865. You can read about it in a New York newspaper. There's a New York printout of Frank Blaze History, Colored Troops Marching Down Main Street in Richmond. You, you could have read about it in Philadelphia newspapers, in Chicago, and San Francisco, my favorite is the Washington, D.C. newspaper, National Republican headlines on the evening of April 3rd, 1865, read, Extra Glorious Fall of Richmond Captured by the Black Troops. <laughs> Pretty clear who captured Richmond. <laughs> well reported in the newspapers of 1865, but again, I challenge you to find it in a single American history textbook today. I challenge you to find a single Civil War bestseller. In fact, I will argue, if, if you write a book and you want it to be a bestseller, you better not put this in your book. <laughs> Whoa. This story remains one of the best kept secrets in American history. Oh, yeah. Also it says here, Lee retreating, Grant pursuing. Lee's famed army of Northern Virginia was forced out of Petersburg and Richmond by these United States Colored Troops and Grant's army. They're on the move. They're headed to western North Carolina. Lee wants to join his army of Northern Virginia with the Confederate Army of Tennessee led by General Joseph E. Johnston. But in the early morning of April 9th, 1865, just south and west of a place called Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, a brigade of United States Colored Troops came up along the Lynchburg Road, and they engaged Lee's Army of Northern Virginia at 3 a.m. in the morning. The skirmish lasted five hours, and at 8 a.m. in the morning, Lee discerned that he could no longer continue to prosecute the war, and later that day, he would surrender to General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, because that is where he was stopped by African-American regiments. There were 13 United States Colored Regiments present, according to the official records, at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, when Lee surrendered to Grant. This is important history. This is important history. The only reason Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia is a stop along the Civil War Trail is because African American soldiers stopped Lee's Army of Northern Virginia at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, forcing Lee to surrender his army to General Grant. And then these soldiers that had captured Richmond, these soldiers that had stopped Lee's army at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, guess where they went? They went to Texas. And by June 12, 1865, you have this, these regiments officially in Texas. Now, it's before June 19th. But when they had code of silence, they weren't going to tell anybody they're in Texas, right? They, they're there. And not only, see this 46th regiment? That's the first Arkansas. So you actually have an Arkansas regiment there. And so what is important? What happens in Texas? On June 15, 1865, United States Colored Troops chased the governor of Texas and 10,000 Confederate soldiers out of the United States into Mexico, thus bringing Texas back into the Union. You can celebrate Juneteenth, but let's celebrate it for the right reason. The right reason is that we're celebrating when Texas was brought back into the Union. Mm -hmm. Just like when you celebrate April 11th, you're celebrating when Arkansas was brought back into the Union. You're celebrating your Emancipation Day. Mm -hmm. The Emancipation Proclamation had to be enforced. 
And when soldiers busted out in Little Rock in 1865, they were celebrating their victory. They were celebrating a victory. They preserved the Union and freed themselves. This is Harper's Weekly and Little Rock, Arkansas. Soldiers returning home to their family. We need to reenact the saving of the Union and the emancipation by the sword. The enforcement of the Emancipation Proclamation. Our memorial in Washington is called the African American Civil War Memorial. But I will often refer to it as simply an American memorial to American freedom fighters. It is because of these American freedom fighters that we honored our memorial and museum that we can all today in this country, in good faith, pledge our allegiance to an indivisible republic. They fought to keep this one nation under God. With liberty and justice for all, they fought expressly to extend the blessings of liberty to all Americans, regardless of race, creed, color, religion, or origin. These are American heroes, American freedom fighters, and their story is the story of a glorious march to liberty. Let their story be heard in Little Rock and across this country, because it is truly an American story that the end of it begins with liberty and justice. Thank you.